Um, this week, uh, our discussion is on the early practice of Pure Land Buddhism. And this is a, a whole branch of Mahayana Buddhism. And, w and when considering Chinese Buddhisms on the whole, we tend to see four kind of categories. Um, two being doctrinal schools, which is that of Tiantai and Huaxian Buddhism, and then two practice-oriented schools, that of Pure Land and Chang. Um, and as we'll find, uh, this practice of Pure Land Buddhism uh, is a lot of things. Um, which implies that there is a lot to talk about, because there's a lot to talk about. Um, as, as a disclosure, I will say I am painting broad generalizations and, to cover a lot of ground very superficially, so bear with me. Um, and for the sake of this discussion, I'll let you know up front, I'm not going to be talking about Jodoshu or Jodo Shinshu, the two most popular schools. Um, Pure Land schools in, uh, of Buddhism in Japan. Um, they originated in the Kamakura period, which is uh, essentially kind of 12th century. That's already 12th century. Instead, we're discussing the foundations that preceded that later development, um, focusing on early yes. Mahayana and Chinese Pure Land Buddhisms. So we'll undoubtedly have a discussion on Jodoshu, Jodo Shinshu, as part of another segment of this whole Intro to East Asian Buddhism um, series, but for now, I hope to explain the dharmic evolution that led to those eventualities. Because it's difficult to discuss and understand Jodo Shu and Jodo Shinshu without understanding that both Jiri and thus Tiantai and Saicho and thus Tendai put a lot of emphasis on Pure Land practice. They both made it an explicit part of each of their teachings. And that's already 6th and 8th centuries, respectively. The Pure Land practices go way back further than that. And, and I should be clear that there is some dispute about if China ever really had a school of Pure Land Buddhism as a, in a strict sense of a school. Because again, this would have been the early development of Mahayana and the fluidity of cults, theories, practices were all mingling in a vast geographic areas at this point. So we already have to start with a much broader concept of Pure Land practice. Um, I'll go back to that original statement, and that is to say that Pure Land Buddhism is a lot of things. When I say a lot, it comes down to what we're actually defining. Already I've drawn a distinction between Japanese Pure Land Buddhisms. We have to know but we have, in the beginning, we have to know what a pure land is and distinguish that from the traditions, teachings, practices that are based on those pure lands. Or that to know that Amitabha or Amida devotion is, and wishing to be reborn in their pure land, Sukhavati, is of one specific part of pure land practice. When we say pure land Buddhism, it encompasses all these things. So again, when we, we just have to know what we're actually defining when we talk about her Pure Land Buddhism. We'll be going over some of these distinctions listed on the slide, but I also want to point, take, point out on the slide that these are, there are two other depictions of um, Pure Lands. We discussed a few months ago um, Mbaji Jaguru, Yakshinyorai, the Medicine Buddha, this is a depiction on the left of, the, of their pure land, strewn with lapis lazuli, and thus why they're a blue color right in the center. The other is of Maitreya Bodhisattva, Miroku Bosatsu, the, the Buddha to come, and this is their heaven, Tushta. And I say heaven only to distinguish the fact that Maitreya is still a Bodhisattva, and therefore she and her heaven is still subject to rebirth. Although she's working tirelessly for our benefit, fulfilling her vows of creating her own pure land by eventually achieving full Buddhahood. Again, there's a lot of things to discuss. So, again, this is going to be very oversimplified, vast generalizations. But please let me know if there are um, of things that you want to dive into in any of these topics, because um, any of these concepts are worth diving into. So just let me know. Um, so 
But what I want to bring particular attention to uh, is the earliest ideas of a Buddha's pure land. Because these ideas start around the turn of the common era into the first century. This is just about the time that China is only just being exposed to early Mahayana's thought. And two particular concepts I want to point out, Buddha Nushpirti and Buddha Kestra. Starting with Buddha Nushpirti, and, and, I, and I apologize, I'm butchering the Sanskrit, so bear with me. Um, this is a, a formative early teaching. It, it combines the notion of Shmirti, which is that of mindfulness, awareness, um, it, it intent, focus upon, and, and then directing that focus towards the Buddha. An early Pali Sutta describes how a devotee, when uh, away from actually listening to the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha, one can meditate on his figure, recall his teachings, and with single focus, bring oneself to a place to connect with Shakyamuni Buddha, as if they were never apart. This method of meditation emphasized concentration on the characteristics of the Buddha, living every moment with the intention of focusing on nothing but the Buddha. As time went on, post Pali Canon, pre Mahayana's thought, as we have covered in past discussion, incorporated generally more visionary, transformative perspectives and practice, more easily accessible teachings, etc. Ideas of the Bodhisattva path, working to relieve the dukkha and suffering of others, shunyata, that of emptiness, the Tathagata Garbha, the, that seed of awakening in all of us. This is big, heavy stuff, mind-bending things. So bear with me as I try to explain, and I steal a little bit from Jen Natia here, in how her logic and argument around this development, because for me, I, it's like I imagine I'm in Central Asia, um, near what would be now uh, Kashmir, kind of Tajikistan. Uh, I'm a renunciant, I'm practicing um, and evolving with a set of Mahayana teachings. I believe that there's no autonomous self. Um, we are because everything else is, and believe that there's awakening in every person, and that there's no full and complete awakening unless we are all awakened together. And then, the way of, oh my Buddha, what am I going to do? That, how am I going to save all these sentient beings comes crashing down. If you haven't felt that weight, while reciting the Bodhisattva vows, I vow to save all sentient beings. If you can't feel that, recite it again. <laughs> it's heavy stuff. So yeah, if, if there's a certain way to, or like a drive to, to find a way to hasten that process, sign me up. Yeah, it, it probably a little selfish, but Hopefully a little altruistic as well. I mean, frankly, if we can define the self as based on an accumulation of all selves, all phenomena, then what is selfishness really, you know? Anyway. <laughs> so now you're trying not only to deepen your own practice, understanding the nature of reality, but to do it on such a massive scale, and then instead of spending 128,000 lifetimes, if there was a, any scenario that might take only 64,000 lifetimes, yeah, yeah, you know I'm going to jump all over it. I mean, frankly, who knows, right? You know, but this drive to find access points, gateways to a deeper understanding, gateways that anyone can use, not just the karmically endowed, the use of Buddha Nushmirti provides an experience for those teachings in that way. Living ethically, morally, cleansing ourselves of discursive thought, purifying our minds, so that calling the Buddha to mind and flooding our consciousness with every detail, allowing minds to settle enough to lift the veil of our perceptions, to bask in the wonder of something else, something that's not dukkha. I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I'm there. The, the idea laid the foundation for Buddha Kestra, the Buddha fields, the realms of influence, places where a particular Buddha resides, a domain that they each preside over. 
Obviously, I'm making huge leaps here because there's a lot to be said about the development of Buddhist cosmology um, on the whole and how they may have or may not have been influenced by outside sources, etc. But again, whole other conversation. Because when we talk about pure land, Buddhism, one should no take note of the term pure land. It's a direct translation of the Chinese, and again, I'm going to butcher it, uh, Jing Tu. That is the, the translation of Parishuddha Buddha Kshetra. Parishuddha meaning pure. The pure land is the Chinese naming of this particular concept of Buddha fields. Personally, I find the wording a little misleading because the Buddha in their lands, there's no distinction between an urbanic state and a samsaric state, uh, pure or impure. Um, the Vimalakirti Sutra speaks to this, and that's, that's only our perceptions that draw a, a, a distinction. But that's, I digress. We've talked about Buddha fields over various different discussions, although fairly indirectly. But for now, understand this idea, well, uh, understanding this idea will round out the evolution uh, and development of Pure Land Buddhism on the whole. It's the idea that all Buddhas have their own realm that they have purified and are for the benefit of those still caught in samsara, us. Many of those, these fields are described in vivid detail, either through sutras and writings or artworks, creating symbols, characteristics, myth, ritual, and so on, as a way to transform our notions of reality, to see things as they really are. We need devices tropes, archetypes, to understand what we cannot conceptually understand. These earliest concepts and descriptions of these fields, these realms of benefit, provided a devotee a method of somehow tapping into that experience. By practicing Shmirti, placing one's mind on, Buddha's, uh, on a Buddha's pure land, one can have the experience of both the mundane and the absolute, samsara and nirvana, in any given moment. We might only imagine the effects that might have on a practitioner. These ideas are thus practiced and developed more and more, was being written and spreading into China freely by the fourth century. Again, there were numerous other examples of various pure lands and thus various cults and practices attributed to each Buddha as we explored Medicine Buddha, cults, their, cult, their cults and devotion, uh, devotional practices, there were many around Kshobhya Buddha, um, Avakishabara Bodhisattva, and so on. But obviously, spoiler alert, Amitabha came to the forefront. Um, and, and, and out of all of these practices, because suffice it to say, Amitabha had a lot going for them. And, and for clarification, Amitayas, Buddha of Infinite Life, um, becomes Amitabha, Buddha of Infinite Light, um, Imotofu in Chinese, Amitabul in Korean, and Amida Nurai in Japanese. There's a whole set of discussions to be had around how and why Amitabha. But considering their dominance in, in later in China and the rest of East Asia, focusing on sutras about Amitabha will be what we cover. Particularly the Pratyupana Samadhi Sutra, the long and short forms of the Suki, uh, Sukhivati Vuya Sutras, and the Amitaya Dhyana Sutra. The former being one I want to particularly focus on specifically because it offers, uh, but also the others are listed, are significantly important to uh, Amitabha Pure Land practice. They, they each describe in various ways the lifespans of the Bodhisattva that would become Amitabha, the, the qualities of Amitabha themselves, and that of the Pure Land Sukhavati, land of bliss, the Western paradise. And more importantly, the manner in which one was to be reborn there. And, and that will become important later. But the, Pr the Pratyapana Samadhi Sutra, the, the first and arguably the most influential of this list, was compiled around the first to second century and, and is the first mention of Amitabha Buddha. Translated as the Sutra on the Samadhi, the meditation of encountering face-to-face -face the present Buddha. This Sutra was pivotal 
and has been used extensively since, um, uh, since as an explanation about how one is to be reborn in the Pure Land. So bear with me, for there's a bit of a quote here, so some of it's on the page there, but um, uh, I'll, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Um, by, and I quote, the Buddha said, By virtue of these dharmas of conduct, one brings about the meditation, and then masters the meditation, in which the Buddhas of the present all stood be, stand before one. By what means does one bring about the meditation in which the Buddhas of the present all stand before the one? In this way, um, Pradapala, who, is, who the Buddha is talking to, uh, if there are any monks or nuns, laymen or laywomen, who keep the precepts in their entirety, they should settle down somewhere all alone and call to mind the presence of Amitabha Buddha in the Western Quarter. Then, in accordance with what they have learned, they should reflect that a thousand million myriad Buddha fields away from here is his land called Sukhavati. In the midst of a host of bodhisattvas, he is preaching the sutras. Let them all constantly call to mind Amitabha Buddha. The next page, it continues. In the same way, Brajapala, Bodhisattvas hear about Amitabha Buddha and call him to mind again and again in this land. Because of this calling to mind, they see Amitabha Buddha. Having seen him, they ask him what dharma it takes to be born in the realm of Amitabha Buddha. Then Amitabha Buddha says to the Bodhisattvas, If you wish to come and be born in my realm, you must always call me to mind again and again. You must always keep this thought in mind without letting up. And thus, you will succeed in coming to be born in my realm. End quote. Oh. <laughs> it's verses like these that influenced Ji to include this sutra in the Mahodraguan, the, Mahodraguan, the great calming and contemplation thus including Pure Land practices within his formation of what would become Tiantai, and to a large extent, East Asian meditation practice on the whole. Slide, please. When considering Amitabha, reflecting back on the notion of Buddha Nushmirti, the imagery, characteristics, and soteriological, it's the salvation-based ideas of a Buddha of infinite wisdom, light, and benefaction, in a land of pure bliss? Yeah, again, fairly influential to the masses. Uh, Amitabha had a lot going for them. Uh, again, a whole conversation about that popularity could be had. Did Zoroastrianism, possibly even Christian influences in a sunlight figure play a part? That the, the Western paradise with the setting sun as a powerful end of life metaphor and how this could have um, collided with Confucian ideals of filial piety. It could have further ingratiated the image into common cultural practices and perspectives. On and on and on. The, the why of all that is so vast, it would be rather presumptuous of me to be able to say that even one of those things, let alone a collection of specific things, is the thing. Whatever the reasoning, Amitabha becomes two predominant Pure Land practices. However, I want to emphasize again, it's the practice itself that's so revolutionary. A leaning on devotion, not just simply living by a strict set of rules. The idea of reciting, imagining, focusing, truly dedicating one's practice. Take a second to just close your eyes and imagine being in a pure land. Imagine if you could have a moment there. Taking from Maxime's conversation about karma a few weeks ago, about being reborn in each cycle of a karmic instant, you can therefore be reborn in any moment, reborn in a pure land. It's a place to benefit your practice, to study directly from the Buddha, a way into the teachings and experience awakening. A method to having a better perspective on reality. A clearer one. One in which we still experience 
the dukkha, but maybe hopefully simply having a better relationship with it. Again, I imagine being the renunciant practitioner traveling along the Silk Road, looking west across the plains of Western China at the setting sun, hearing these descriptions of Sukhavati and Amitabha and thinking, yeah, yeah, I like that. In this way, the idea of Buddha Nushmiriti comes to play a crucial role in Mahayana practice. Staying focused on every detail of the Buddha, the qualities, the characteristics, reciting and venerating the name, invoking the very nature of the Buddha, body, speech, and mind. We did a similar type of example of that last week in reciting the mantra Gati Gati Pada Gati Pada Sam Gati Bodhisattva during the um, second meditation. It's a, it's a way to feel, experience something. Mantra recitation is one way. The Tibetan Tantras are another way. Mandala are another way. Dharani are another way. We may wonder about the assertion of the sutras that through this type of meditation, that will actually meet a particular Buddha actually receive teachings, etc. We may consider it fantastical, fantasyful, magical. But as Monshin Sensei has brought up several times in the last few weeks, it's not mystical. This isn't mysticism. I mean, we call the experiences visions, but what if it isn't an image at all? We can't call it even a feeling, because that would imply using these impure devices to describe the process of experiencing something that is beyond our perception in the first place. If we become noble in our actions, purify ourselves, truly clear our minds of discursive thought, have a single, a single focus, practicing Buddha Nushmirti, can, can we really know what that experience would feel like, look like? How would you explain that to someone else? The very point of the Pure Land is to be able to see the true nature of reality that we're already in. To redefine we, what we think is real and imaginary. That's what the sutras try to explain. These images, statues, symbols, practices, these things are trying to do just that. We should see them as an explanatory process, not a descriptor of an end result. We cannot define that thing, that awareness, that awakening. But these depictions have worked. These methods have worked. Do you really think pure land practices would be this prevalent as a phenomenon in this world at this very moment if they did not work for providing solace from dukkha for millions of people across this earth? Do you really think that there would be, there would be libraries of sutras, commentaries, extant writings, uh, depictions, representations, all describing just the Pure Lands and the methods of experiencing them if they actually did nothing. That, that even after 500 years of devoted practitioners using these messages, Dr. E and his moment in time might think, huh, is this worthwhile including in my manual of meditation? 200 years later, Saicho reconfirms it. He puts, he puts Pure Land Practices in, a, in an important place within Tendai teachings and practice. He names one of the 12-year practices on Mount Hiei after Nambutsu practice. And it's still done today. And then two, 1,200 years after the first ideas of Buddha fields, Jodoshu and Jodoshinshu put all of their emphasis on that one practice. They became so 
important and powerful. They have impacted so many lives. They are still in practice today. Would it really have been such a history if there was nothing actually happening? We may not feel drawn to the practice. We may admonish or think lesser of the techniques. That's rather obtuse. Whether we have issue with devoting ourselves to Amitabha or Amida alone, or it feels too heaven-like, or somehow devotional practice is intimidating, however pure land practice may present itself, and whatever the issue may be, we cannot deny that it has largely had a positive influence, again, on a huge number of people. It has been a lot of things for a lot of people, and it has continued to provide experiences that encourage folks along the Buddha path. We cannot know the breadth of what this type of experience as a bag of bones can have, but we can push up against those boundaries to try something that may help deepen our practice, focus our minds. And frankly, I got a lot of great practitioners before me who understood its importance, and I trust and have confidence in them. So I trust and have confidence in this practice. Get out of the idea that it's praying to, be, to a being. Instead, try to bathe in the experience of Amitabha-ness. It's an, immer an, an immersion, an, an, an overwhelming, an, an unveiling. It, it's a get yourself out of the way and just feel. Just do. Can we suspend our disbelief enough to allow for an archetypal set of characteristics to create in our minds something that can have beneficial impacts on us? Can we allow that creation to be universally felt, universally fed by each utterance of a single name, Namo Amida Butsu.